Hi. Welcome to Homeopathy Medicines. Today in this classic homeopathic materia medical lecture discuss about homeopathic medicine lachesis. By Dr. Farrington, MD. Before starting this video please subscribe to this channel. We need support from you to make this channel more beautiful and more informative. Now going to discuss about lachesis, its uses and symptoms. Now let us consider lachesis. First of all, in order that you may comprehend the subject, I wish to refer to those symptoms which are universal. We notice that lachesis is especially suitable to persons who have a peculiar sensitiveness of the surface of the body. Even if the patient is lying in a stupor, and you touch him, as when you try to feel his pulse, he will show that he is disturbed thereby. Hard rubbing or pressure may cause no trouble at all. Dr. Herring, who first proved lachesis, could never tolerate tight clothing about his neck. He always wore his collars loose. He noticed that during the proving, this symptom annoyed him more than usual, so he faithfully made note of the occurrence, but did not place much value on it. Since then, the symptom has been confirmed many times in practice, and has been found true, not only as a local symptom of the neck, but as a symptom of the body universally. The explanation seems to be that there is an irritation of the peripheral nerves, and because of this, the patient cannot bear touch or slight pressure. It is no evidence of inflammation, and must not be confounded with the inflammatory soreness of aconite, arnica, or belladonna. This sensitiveness also differs from that of apis which has a bruised sore feeling more acute than that of arnica. It also differs from the sensitiveness of Nux vomica and Lycopodium which have it about the waist only after a meal. Next we find that the drug is prone to affect the left side of the body. Homeopaths have been criticized for attributing to drugs the power of acting on one side of the body in preference to another. The simple fact that disease chooses sides ought to be enough to lead one to believe that drugs may do the same. The left side of the body is more apartment to be affected by drugs having a depressing action, because that side of the body is the weaker. Another peculiarity of lachesis arising, probably, from its action on the pneumogastric nerves, is its influence on sleep. This is a universal symptom, that the patient is worse from sleep, he sleeps into an aggravation. This latter is more marked than the former. If it is true that the lachesis has an influence on the centers of respiration, and is a weakening drug, we can understand why sleep should aggravate. During our waking hours, we have some control over respiration. During sleep, this voluntary control is lost. It is when this change takes place that the weakening effect of lachesis is asserted. Lachesis is a very valuable remedy at the clernexis for the reason that the woman has exhausted herself by frequent pregnancies and hard work. In this worn out condition there occurs a sudden cessation of the menses. Non-appearing discharges make the lachesis patient worse. Perhaps, before the clernexis, she was worse before than during the flow. The pulse is trembling. There are the peculiar headache, and the annoying symptoms of the mind showing that the lachesis here presents no exception to the rule that attacks on debilitated and weakened persons. Now, let us consider some of the symptoms of lachesis in detail, first, as to the mental symptoms. The patient is nervous, anxious, loquacious, jumping from subject to subject, sometimes with fear at being poisoned. Interesting stories excite immoderately and even intensify the bodily symptoms, he refuses the medicine you offer. Sometimes thinksiety assumes a peculiar type, and he imagines that he is dead and preparations are being made for the funeral. The loquacity may be accompanied with sleepiness and yet inability to sleep. Ideas chase each other so rapidly through the mind, he cannot write them down. He sits up late at night, mental activity then being unusually increased. But this stage of excitement is commingled with another, which soon entirely supersedes it. The mind is weakened. The patient is able to think only with difficulty. He has to think how words are spelled. Sulfur and lycopodium also have this symptom. Like theratian and perhaps mosses, there is vertigo, worse on closing the eyes, or the vertigo may be worse on sitting or lying down. 
in this vertigo, fainting, etc., you may compare Theridion. Here, too, the dizziness is worse with eyes closed, but a distinctive feature you will find is that vertigo, pains, and nausea are intensely aggravated by noise. Both remedies have sun pains. Arsenic, hydrocyanic acid, digitalis, veritrum ALB, camphor, you should compare in vertigo and fainting from cardiac weakness. La Erosericis or hydrocyanic acid is needed in long-lasting faints, there seems to be no reactive power, the face is pale blue, the surface cold. If fluids are forced down the throat, they roll audibly into the stomach. If the syncope is attendant upon some poison in the system, as scarlatina, the symptoms are similar, the eruption being livid, and when pressed, regains its color very slowly. Digitalis also rivals the Aphidians in syncope, with the antecedent dim vision, the pulse is generally very slow, and the patient often complains of nausea and deathly weakness in the epigastrium. Camphor and Veritrum album display coldness and cold sweaty skin, in the latter remedy, the forehead is cold and sweaty. The face may be red while lying, but if raised, it turns pale and the patient faints, the pulse is thready. Camphor has icy surface, sudden sinking, as in La Erosericis, and although so cold, he throws off clothing so soon as he is strong enough to move, even though he be still unconscious. In ill effects of the heat of the sun, compare glenoyine, belladonna, camphor, natrum carb, and theridion, see above. The first two, with bloated red face, paralytic weakness, glen, unconsciousness, etc., resemble lachesis, but the latter displays the effects of heat upon one already exhausted. All the aphidians are intolerant of warm, relaxing weather, and so we find many ailments returning in spring and summer. In the lachesis case, the patient may be an inebriate or one prostrated by mental fatigue. The sun's heat makes him languid, dizzy, faint, or, if congestions ensue, the face is dark red and looks at the same time sunken and cadaverous, the extremities are cold. Here camphor may be demanded if vitality is ebbing away, the fainting spells growing worse, and the body icy cold and bathed in cold sweat. Both lachesis and nitrum carb are useful when hot weather fatigues, in which case you should compare, also, selenium and nitrum myrrh. Returning now, after this digression, to the mental symptoms of lachesis, we find that the delirium is of a low, muttering type. At other times, the patient seems to be going deeper and deeper into a torpid state, with coolness of the extremities, trembling of the hands and body. When asked to protrude the tongue, it comes out tremblingly, or catches in the teeth, or, if he does get it out, it is trembling, and is usually coated dark brown, sometimes with little blisters on the tip. The lips crack and ooze dark blood. Loquacity is commonly followed by depression, and by weakness which amounts to a typhoid state, then he is delirious, the delirium not being of the violent belladonna type. The typhoid type is shown by the dark coating on the tongue, the paralytic state of the brain by the difficulty in protruding the tongue and its catching on the teeth. These symptoms show lachesis to be an invaluable remedy in typhoid fever, and in fact in all diseases of a typhoid type. The loquacity just referred to is particularly characteristic. Another mental state which these typhoid patients may have as indicating lachesis, is that they feel as if they were under the influence of some overwhelming power. Diarrhea is usually present and is characterized by the horribly offensive odor to the stools. That is a characteristic of lachesis which will also aid you in diphtheria or scarlatina. Even when the stools are formed and in every way natural in other respects, they give forth this horrible odor. Lachesis may also be indicated late in the course of typhoid fever when the patient lies in a stupor with dropping of the lower jaw, and other symptoms indicative of impending paralysis of the brain. Let me now speak of some of the concordant remedies of lachesis in these conditions. In the loquacity just mentioned, lachesis should be compared with stramonium and agricus. Stramonium you will distinguish from lachesis by the red face and the other evidences of great sensorial excitement. Mephitis, 
Acta racemosa and Paris quadrifolia also produce loquacity. Under mephitis it is as if one were drunk. Under Acta racemosa, the loquacity is usually associated with menstrual suppression, with puerperal mania or as a part of delirium tremens. Lachesis is also useful in this last condition I have named, Acta cures wild imaginings of rats, etc., sleeplessness, wild crazed feeling about the head, incessant talking with continual change of subject, the patient must move about. Lachesis has more marked trembling of the hands, diarrhea and great exhaustion with the loquacity and hallucinations. Paris quadrifolia causes a garrulity which is much like that produced by tea, a sort of vivacity with love of prattling. In these typhoid types of fever, you may compare lachesis with opium, hyosiumus, arnica, lycopodium, and rustoxicodendron. Opium, is indicated in typhoid fever with this threatening paralysis of the brain, but the symptoms under it, refer to a very different condition from that of lachesis. The symptoms which indicate opium in addition to this dropping of the lower jaw are, unconsciousness, stertorous breathing, and a dark or brownish red hue of the face. The darker red the face, the more is opium indicated. With lachesis, the cerebral condition is due to the effect of the typhoid poison on the brain. With opium, it is a secondary effect of the intense congestion of that organ. Hyosiumus is perhaps more similar to lachesis than is opium. Here we find the lower jaw dropped, the patient is weak and trembling and there is twitching of the muscles. This last is a necessary symptom of hyosiumus. Here too, there is snoring breathing as in opium, with involuntary stool and great prostration. Arnica is also indicated when there is great congestion of the brain. The patient lies in a stupor with lower jaw dropped and eyes fixed. The face is dark red and stool and urine are passed involuntarily. In addition to these symptoms and separating it from the drugs just mentioned, you find here and there on the body, dark spots irregular in outline and having a black and blue appearance, etchimosis as they are called. Lycopodium is the complement of lachesis and is, therefore, more apartment to be indicated after it than any remedy I have mentioned. The symptoms which indicate lycopodium are these, the patient lies in a stupor with lower jaw dropped, and rattling breathing. There is a rattling of phlegm in the throat during both inspiration and expiration and the eyes are fixed and set and are swimming in tears. Lycopodium is the most important remedy we have in impending paralysis of the brain, by that I mean to say, that it is the most frequently indicated. Leaving the mental symptoms of lachesis and the indications of it and its analogues in typhoid fever, we will next consider its head symptoms. We find that it produces a headache worse in or over the left eye, of a throbbing character, with sharp pains, very severe, which may come at the climaxis, or as the accompaniment of an ordinary cold, relieved as soon as the quarries appears. There is a universal characteristic, so soon as a discharge is established the patient feels better. I have relieved dysmenorrhea with lachesis when there was a headache preceding the dysmenorrhea but relieved so soon as the flow was established. In catarland rheumatic headaches you may compare mercurius, sencona, pulsatilla, bryonia, and gelsimium. Sencona relieves headache from suppressed coryza when the pain is worse from the least draft of air. Bryonia and pulsatilla come into use when the checked catarrhal secretion is thick yellow and green respectively. Gelsimium when motility is lessened, and the patient is drowsy with neurologic pains from occiput to forehead and face. The headache may also arise from disordered stomach or bowels, or may be an accompaniment of fevers, and of diseases of zymotic origin. The patient has an upward tendency of the blood, with throbbing in the head, dark redness of the face, puffed face, confusion of the mind, all the way from simple confusion to absolute stupor often accompanied, too, with partial blindness, palpitation of the heart, and fainting. The pains about the head are briefly as follows, sharp sticking which seem to concentrate at the root of the nose. At other times, the pains go from the zygoma to the ear. This direction of the pains is characteristic. As a parallel of this shooting pain from zygoma to the ear, we have pains from the head, 
going down through and into the eyes. These all are characteristic pains of lachesis. There is an additional one that I will now mention, which is probably of rheumatic origin, pains in the head, going down into the shoulders and neck of the affected side, and often accompanied with slight stiffness of the neck, either cat or lower rheumatic. You may have lachesis indicated in more severe forms of head trouble, for instance, in inflammation of the membranes of the brain, sharp pains in the head, making the patient scream out, tongue showing pupillae, strawberry tongue, patient rolls the head from side to side, and bores it into the pillow. Particularly useful is this when an exanthem, scarlatina or erysipelas, has not developed or has B.N. repercussed. The patient is at first very drowsy, but unable to sleep, trembling or palpitation of the heart. Soon stupor ensues, and he becomes heavy and sleepy, and you can rouse him with difficulty. In intense head pains as in meningitis you should remember the relation between belladonna and lachesis, the difference between these drugs being rather one of degree. Both are suited to meningitis from erysipelas, to scarlatina, apoplexy, etc., but the former represents the initial stages of these diseases or states in which, even though there be stupor, still there are evidences of irritation and not wholly of depression. Thus, the patient often starts from his heavy sleep, cries out, grinds the teeth, awakens frightened, etc. His pulse is usually strong and the surface congestions are bright red, or if more intense, deep red, and livid. If there is an eruption, as in scarlatina, it is red, even if sparse, and vitality is not so low that the extremities are cool, the rash bluish, and the cellular tissue infiltrated and threatening an unhealthy suppuration, as in the snake poison. Often, however, after the use of belladonna we find evidences of cerebral exhaustion, or blood poisoning, or impending paralysis, in which case lachesis may be required. The patient still cries out in sleep or awakens frightened, the tongue still shows elevated pupillae, the head is hot, and the face is red, but the pulse is quicker and more feeble, the feet are cool, the surface heat is irregularly distributed, the mind is more befogged and drowsiness is stealthily creeping on, the inflamed part or the pseudomembrane or the eruption, as the case may be, is becoming more purplish, these indicate the change. Considering the action of lachesis on the special senses, we find the eyes to be affected by the drug. Dimness of vision is caused by it, dark spots appear before the eyes, sight suddenly seems to fade away, feeling of faintness and palpitation of the heart, with these, nervous trembling. Lachesis is one of the leading remedies for dim sight as an evidence of heart disease and vertigo. We may also use it with good effect for what we may term retinal apoplexy. There it acts very well in causing an absorption of the blood. The nearest remedies to lachesis in this condition of the retina, are crotalus, phosphorus and arnica. Scrofulous ophthalmia calls for lachesis when the symptoms are decidedly worse after sleep. There are great photophobia and pains of a burning, stitching, shooting character, extending to the temples, top of the head and occiput. There are also itching and stinging in the eyes and lids worse from touch. Vision is misty with black flickerings before the eyes. Crotalus may also be called for in keratitis when there are cutting pains around the eyes, lids swollen in the mornings, ciliary neuralgia with these cuttings, worse at menses. In diseases of the ear, lachesis may be remedial for roaring and singing in the ears, and different sorts of tinnitus aureum which are relieved by putting the finger in the ear and working it. This shows that the tinnitus is not congestive, but of catarrhal origin. The wax is altered in quality and becomes pasty and offensive. There is swelling between the ear and mastoid process with throbbing pain and stiffness. You may here compare nitric acid, capsicum, orum, pepper, and silicea. Alaps and crotalus like lachesis have an action on the ears. The former produces a catar with black cerumen in the ears, tinnitus aureum and atarrhea. In elapse, the discharge is yellow-green, liquid and bloody. Only lachesis seems to have the eustachian stoppage better from shaking the finger in the meatus. Crotalus causes a stuffed feeling in the ears, worse in the right, 
associated with a feeling as if hot ear wax was trickling out. The face in the Lachesis patient varies, of course, with the condition that obtains in the system at the time. In many of the diseases in which the remedy is indicated, the face has an earthy pallor. In exanthematic diseases it is apartment to be bloated or puffed, bluish red, if the eruption comes out, it comes out sparsely and is of a dark color. Its expression is anxious and painful with the stupor, the face is disfigured, looks as after a debauch, there are blue circles around the eyes. With abdominal troubles as an ague, the face is earthy gray. Lachesis also has convulsions of the face, lockjaw, distortion of the face, stretching the body backwards, screaming, feet cold and itching. For swollen face, you may compare, apis, belladonna, arsenic, lycopodium, hyosiumus, rustox, pulsatilla, strimonium, colicarb, and phosphorus. For sickly, pale or earthy complexion, arsenic, pho, lycopodium, carbovege, rustox, sencona, phosphorus and phosphoric acid. Blue about the eyes, arsenic, cuprum, phosphorus, sacalcorneatum and veretrum album. Debauched look, baptisia, hyosiumus, carbovege, nux vomica, sulfur, opium, nux moscata. In facial convulsions, compare, Nux vomica, hyosiumus, belladonna, hydrocyanic acid, lycopodium, cicuta, camphor, phytolacca, arsenicum, apis, arsenic and colicarb. Agree in puffing of the face even without any redness. In the first, there is also smarting of the eyelids, and a sensation of stiffness. In the second, it is noticed about the eyes, glibble and forehead, also nitrum ARS. Kali carb has the well-known sacs of the upper lids, and also sudden swelling of the cheeks. The expression, complexion, etc., of arsenic are very similar to those of the snake poisons. The anxiety and pain are marked by more restlessness and irritability, fear of death, etc., and the sunken face is more completely Hippocratic, with pointed features, sunken eyes and cold sweat. When yellow or earthy, it is cachectic. If trismic symptoms are present, the patient will be found lying pale, and as if dead, though yet warm. Suddenly, he arouses and goes into severe convulsions only again to relapse into this sort of cataleptic rigidity. The eyes are partly open with gum on the conjunctiva. Lycopodium has pale or yellow face, deeply furrowed, looking elongated. The convulsive movements are unique. All through the provings of this remedy, you will note an alternation of contraction and expansion. And in the face, you note, tongue pushed out and withdrawn, spasmodic trembling of the facial muscles, angles of mouth alternately drawn up and relaxed, ala inasi alternately expanded and contracted. The eyes may be partly open and covered with mucus, comma, a bad symptom, generally being indicative of brain exhaustion. Phosphorus has a pale face but it is distinguished by its ashy anemic appearance. This should be remembered, since this remedy, like the Ophidia, has puffy face, sunken face, blueness around the eyes and blue lips. Hyosiumus is very similar to Lachesis in facial expression and in the convulsive phenomena. It has a marked stupid, drunken look, the face is distorted and blue, or swollen and brown-red, starting. Twitchings of single groups of muscles are noted. Hunger appears before the attacks. Stramonium is readily distinguished by its swollen, turgid face, fright on awakening, renewal of spasms from light, and the contracted, gloomy expression, with wrinkling of the forehead. Hydrocyanic acid closely agrees in convulsive symptoms and in the color of the face. Like collapse, it has fluids roll audibly into the stomach but the latter has it more as a spasmodic contraction of the sphincters, followed by sudden relaxation. In convulsions, the surface, in the acid, is pale blue and the muscles of the face, jaw and back are affected. Suddenly a shock is felt which passes like lightning from head to foot and then comes the spasm. Here, the remedy is more like Sikuta and Helleborus than Lachesis. But Sikuta has, like the snake poisons, Great difficulty in breathing from spasm, 
and, more than any remedy, it produces staring, the spasm is followed by disproportionately severe weakness. Camphor is readily distinguished from lachesis by the coldness, and by the withdrawing of the lip, showing the teeth. Lachesis is indicated in the erysipelas of the face. Characteristically, the disease will be most marked on the left side. The face at first may be quite bright red, but it soon takes on a dark bluish hue. There is considerable infiltration into the cellular tissue, so that we have puffiness of the eye of the affected side. Now the characteristic bluish face, is the accompanying weakness. Even from the beginning, when the skin is yet red, the pulse, though accelerated, is weak, the feet are apartment to be cool, and the head is affected sympathetically, so that the patient readily becomes drowsy, with muttering delirium or the opposite condition of pseudo-excitement, the loquacity, which I have already mentioned, obtains. You must now distinguish the cerasipolis of lachesis from the remedies that are akin to it, among these is belladonna. In its early symptoms, belladonna bears no resemblance to lachesis. But in the course of the disease, when the inflammation is so intense that the bloated face grows bluish red, threatening gangrene, or when the brain becomes affected, differentiation is necessary. Here, both have hot head and cold feet, delirium, dry tongue, etc. But lachesis suits when the cerebral symptoms fail to yield to belladonna, when the excitement gives way to muttering stupor, the pulse is weak and rapid and the cool surface of the limbs is plainly due to fading vitality rather than to the upward tendency of the blood. Crotalus holds the same relation to belladonna. Apis mellifica is indicated in erysipelas when the affected parts exhibit a tendency to become edematous. If the face is involved, the eyelids protrude like sacks of water. The face is usually of a pinkish hue or it may be dark purplish, but it never has the deep bluish black hue of lachesis. Although there may be a similar destructive tendency, the condition of nervous irritation produced by the bee poison is very different from that of any of its congeners. It is a fidgety, nervous state, a fretted feeling, which deprives the patient of sleep, though he feels sleepy. Rustoxicodendron is suited to the vesicular form of erysipelas. The patient is drowsy as under lachesis, little blisters form on and about the face, and the face is dark red not the bluish black of the lachesis nor the purple of the intensified apis case. If vesicles form in the lachesis case, they quickly fill with pus. Speaking relatively, rus produces more vesication and burning stinging itching, lachesis, more bluish red inflammation with gangrenous tendency. Euphorbium, since it causes gangrene with erysipelas, anxiety as from poison, apprehensiveness, dim vision, etc deserves your notice. The right cheek is of a livid, or dark red hue, vesicles form as large as bees, and are filled with a yellow liquid. The pains are boring, gnawing, and digging in character and extend from the gum into the ear, with itching and crawling, when pains are relieved. Lachesis may be indicated in prosopalgia when the pain is worse on the left side and when there are tearing pains above the orbit and digging and screwing pains around the molar bone. Delirium appears as soon as the eyes are closed. The teeth decay and grumble. The gums are swollen and bluish with throbbing pains. Lachesis may be successfully used in periodontitis and abscesses at the root of a filled tooth, as may also mercurius, hepar and silicea. Of the allied remedies in toothache none is so similar as mercurius, which, like lachesis, relieves when the gum is inflamed, and the tooth decayed with abscess at the root. It is said to have a direct action on the dentine. The pains are tearing and pulsating, and shoot into the face and ears. In lachesis the gum is swollen, and at the same time dark red and livid, or, it is tense and hot, and looks as if it would crack. Mercurius is markedly worse from warmth of bed. Lachesis often follows the latter, or is needed at once, if the patient has been previously salivated, only Mercurius has dirty gums, with white edges. In sore mouth, aphthy, etc., lachesis should be compared with baptisia, nitric acid, muriatic acid, arsenic, and apis, while Mercurius compares more with carbo-veg, staph isagria, iodine, 
sulfuric acid, nitric acid. Baptisia has blood oozing from the gums, which look dark red or purple, salivation, fetter, offensive stools, and thus far is precisely like lachesis. Both, too, are indicated in the stomachus attending the last stages of thysis. Decide by general differences and also by the tongue, which in the former, is yellow or brown down the center, with red, shining edges. In the latter, it is red, dry, and glistening, especially at the tip, and has its sides and tip covered with blisters. Nitric acid causes an acrid saliva, the pains in the mouth are pricking in character as from a splinter, the aphthy and gums are usually whitish, raw places, with shooting pains. Muriatic acid presents deep, bluish ulcers, with dark edges, mucous membrane denuded in places, which latter are dotted with aphthy. Arsenic looks very much like lachesis, with livid, bleeding gums, edges of tongue blistered or ulcerating diarrhea. The burning is more intense, and is associated with restlessness, compelling motion in spite of the weakness. In gangrena or as it causes more acute pain, and heat in the mouth, both have bluish or black sloughing ulcers. Arsenic has more mental irritability. Apis has blisters marking the border of the tongue, or in clusters. The mouth is usually rosy red, swollen, and there are marked stinging pains, the margin of the tongue feels scalded, as does the mouth generally. Carbo-veg, staph isagria, sulfuric acid agree more with mercurius, the gums are white, spongy, ulcerated, rather than livid. Staph isagria may cause sores, which look bluish red or yellow, especially is it needed after abuse of mercury or in syphilitic cases, when the general debility is marked with sunken face, blue around the eyes, etc. Sulfuric acid requires great debility, yellowish white gums, yellow skin, the patient is nervous, and hasty, and constantly complains of trembling, which, however, is not observed by others. Salicylic acid causes the common canker sores, with burning soreness and fetid breath. Lycopodium produces these sores near the frenum of the tongue, lachesis at the tip, and nitric acid, phytolacca, natrum hypochlor, on the inner side of the cheeks. Phytolacca has some systematic resemblance to lachesis here as well as in the throat, see next lecture. Both cause great weakness, dim vision, sunken face, blue around the eyes, sore mouth, tongue blistered along the edges, tip of tongue red, roof of mouth sore profuse saliva. The poke root may be distinguished by the great pain at the root of the tongue when swallowing. These pains are a part of the tired aching and soreness which are general over the body. Helleborus produces canker in the mouth, but the sores are yellowish, with raised edges. Returning to the subject of decayed teeth, it may be noted that creosote cures pains from teeth to left side of face, teeth decay rapidly, gums bleed, the blood being dark, but the accompanying facial pains are burning, and the patient is excitable, nervous, even, as in children, thrown into convulsions. Thuja causes a decay just at the border of the gums, leaving the crown apparently sound. Gums dark red in streaks. Teeth turn yellow and grumble. Thanks for watching this video. If you want more videos like this, please subscribe to this channel and press the bell icon. Comment us your feedback. Like and share this video with your friends and family. For paid and free consultancy online, visit homeopathymedicines.com and mashclinic.com. Thank you. Have a nice day. Stay healthy, stay happy.